What My Granddad Told Me About the Martians by David Reese Thomas. Back in 1938, before we had to move again, I remember we would often go to my granddad's house for tea. He lived in a small cottage on the outskirts of our village with his dogs, a blind Jack Russell and a very old Yorkshire Terrier with three legs. I was 10 years old and it was always very exciting for me as my granddad knew lots and lots of old stories. My favorite was the one about the time before the Martians came, when he used to travel on long journeys all around the world. He died a few years later, and we looked after his two dogs until they also died. But I never forgot about what he had said about the time before the Martians. He said that there had been huge ships, and long busy railways, and that if people lived together in huge cities full of horses and carriages, and offices, and shops, and banks, and zoos, and great parks, and all sorts of other amazing things. We didn't have any of that then, not even in 1938. Even though the Martians had been gone for lots of years, our shops were boring. Nothing like the one Granddad talked about, and we certainly didn't have zoos anymore. Even now, 20 years later, our world is sort of the same. They sometimes talk about building a museum of the Martians, but I don't like that idea. What I want to see is a ship like my granddad talked about, or a palace like he once showed me in an old pictograph. Something special and human. I don't want to see the Martians. They spoiled everything. They took all of those things away from us. My son will turn two in the winter, and I want to feel less doubtful about the future. My wife tells me I shouldn't complain and we should be grateful, and I understand. I really do. They do their best for those of us that live and those of us that have survived, but I feel sad when I think about my granddad and everything that's been lost. It's been 50 years since the Martians came and went, but I wonder if we'll ever really understand what happened and what we're going to do from here on in. I do have a new job though now, working on a small farm just outside of what used to be Woking that our regional government set up. We were responsible for providing the whole of southeast of England with milk and cheese and butter. We have some sheep for wool so we don't get cold in the winter. There are about 50 of us on the farm and it seems to work quite well. People seem happy. Maybe I'm just too pessimistic. We converted the old farmhouse into new milking sheds a few months ago, and yesterday I found something while I was looking through the upstairs rooms. It was a small plastic ship that had been chewed at the end so that its bow was wrinkled and torn. I picked it up and put it in my pocket and gave it to my son when I got home. He smiled at me and I stroked his hair gently. I knew that one day I would tell him about the Martians about my granddad, about the time that we had ships and railways and palaces and cities and great parks and, and well, everything. I'll tell him everything. Bruises and Nectar by J. Miles A flickering light spasmodically turns the twisted wreckage into a black and white sketch of a chaotic mess. The illumination comes from a workspace lamp its shade torn away during the bombardment that ruined this flagship. There's a glint in the shadows. A half-empty bottle of with-a-bullet bourbon emerges to be placed carefully next to the battered lamp. A grimy hand, protruding from what once were pristine Officer Whites, retracts into the darkness. Hello, little beast. Who sent you? Tarila Mason, the owner of the arm, leans forward and steadies the lamp. The drone swings to get a better view of this tattered admiral. In doing so, it reveals the perfect Union roses etched into its tiny flanks. Good timing, drone from home. How lovely to see the unbesmirched emblem of those we died for. <laughs> Nearly as pristine as the history you'd write to cover this dirty deed. It hovers, activity lights bright but signaling lights off. What, no praise for the woman who supported your betrayal to this inglorious conclusion? Still nothing. The woman reaches down, lifts herself a little, and then drags an upturned ammunition box forward. Sitting back down, she winces, then extends her right leg and points to it. Shrapnel, likely to be the bone charts for my lovely lieutenant. He threw himself between me and the blast that finished this deck off. She takes a long drink, and then puts the quarter full bottle down, and then grimaces sidelong at the drone. You've escaped, haven't you? The entire uprising was a diversion. A million people put their faith in lying thieves. We'll be lucky if 10,000 of us remain to face whatever justice the thorns of the Union gold meet out. All of that propaganda about making better history. There's no way this is a coincidental outcome. You deliberately threw the 12 colonies into Bedlam. The signaling lights blinked rapidly, staccato Z code spelling out. 
You delayed them longer than we expected. I fought to save the people who believed, not for a cause I'd started to distrust. The lights flashed in reply. You still fought. She picks up the bottle and drains it. As I said, I fought to limit the evil you begat. The bottle spins away to smash unseen. I fought because either way, I would have a victory. A short sequence this time. How? I'm presuming you loaded everything from the storehouses on Largo 4? It certainly looked like the sort of loot greedy cowards would take. All those containers of treasure and fine wine? She leans forward. My marines added three shielded boxes and a receiver. The latter being the only way to deal with the Ulam chambers and the former. I'm no kind of expert, but my people told me such units, taken from three raw class nuclear pulse drives, would produce a very big explosion if set up correctly. Tarila smiles. About now, your security people are laughing, informing you they've already found and disabled the transceiver. Assuming your security is competent, of course. Did you know a clockwork timer to release a spring is all you need to trigger an unconstrained antimatter injection into reactive mass? That receiver wasn't to set anything off. It was to let me warn you if my paranoid mistake in time for you to eject those boxes and reach a safe distance. The drone goes dark and drops like a stone. Time's up. I win. You don't get to write the history. Reaching back into the shadows, she pulls out another bottle of bourbon. With a rueful smile, she starts drinking. Bring on that court, Marshal. The Vaccine by Matthew C.R. Cartron The planetary nation of Ozda was illiterate. In English, and in many other faraway languages, that is. It was practical to learn the languages of nearby planets, but beyond that, it made little sense. A waste of time, actually. Without a translator, it would have been difficult for them to communicate with Earth, a planetary nation thousands of light years away that they had never heard of. Not until the neighboring planets had mentioned its cutting-edge technology. Apparently, Earth had the only solution to it, the devastating disease that jumped from planet to planet, wiping out populations as it went. Scared out of their minds and desperate to evade the disease, planetary nations began to contact Earth. The terrestrials were pressured by these nations to share their medical technology. But the complexity of the vaccine, according to Earth, was far too difficult to explain in a reasonable amount of time. Planets were dying, of course, and there was little time to spare. But there was no need for concern. Earth had promised it would send out doctors to vaccinate the populations of the other planets a feat that could be managed in less time than the cumbersome alternative. Ozda's request for a doctor was addressed promptly, and Dr. Ashford of Earth arrived in less than 24 hours, bringing with him hundreds of large crates all filled with the coveted vaccine. To speed up the vaccination process, Dr. Ashford demonstrated to the Austin doctors the correct procedure for administration of the vaccine. It was quite simple, really, just a slight insertion at the shoulder and a brief downward application of the pressure onto the plunger. With the help of the Ozidan doctors, Dr. Ashford had every citizen vaccinated in less than six hours. When Dr. Ashford finished and was ready to return home, he congratulated the governing body of Ozda and said that Earth would send a representative to check on the planet in a few weeks. After Dr. Ashford's departure, Ozda discovered that the neighboring planets of Jugtha, Regaitai, and Ayalut had all been vaccinated around the same time by other terrestrial doctors. The four planets all felt confident now that the threat of the mysterious disease was all but vanquished. The people of Asta returned to their daily lives, thankful of the service Earth had so selflessly rendered to them. And perhaps now they would consider learning English, some of the citizens had even joked. But three days later, everything changed for the Austins. It began with a cough and a mild headache. When a representative from Earth arrived in Asta several weeks later, with several terrestrial families, he was hardly surprised by the scene in front of him. After all, it wasn't the first planet he had helped colonize. Down to Basics by Patricia Stewart After unimaginable losses, the Earth Alliance was still unable to breach the draconian military installation on Hydra II. The fortress sat safely within a walled city that was protected by 16 electrostatic cannons strategically placed around the perimeter. When fired, the cannons projected an attenuated subspace energy wave that caused the electrical bonds between the atoms to vibrate out of control. Similar 
in some respects to the way a microwave caused water molecules to vibrate in order to produce heat. When the spectrographic sensors identified the target material, the electrostatic cannons fired a specific frequency wave to break up the appropriate atomic bonds, i.e. either metallic, covalent, or ionic, depending on whether the material was a metal, polymer, or ceramic. Once the bonds were broken, the object harmlessly disintegrates into its constituent atoms. Any atoms that might be intrinsically harmful, such as radioactive ones like uranium or plutonium, were repelled by the nucleonic deflector shield. Conventional military tactics appeared useless against draconian defenses. After months of brainstorming, a young chemist proposed an unorthodox solution. Although few senior scientists thought the plan would work, it was eventually approved, mostly because nobody could come up with anything better. A few weeks later, a 250,000-ton computer-controlled space freighter was brought into its geosynchronous orbit above the draconian installation. As dawn approached, the onboard computer fired its massive thruster to begin the deorbiting sequence. The new flight path caused the ship to drop vertically downward towards the military installation. When the freighter passed the Karman line, the draconian spectrographic sensors detected the exterior pika shielding of the spaceship, and the electrostatic cannons began to fire. As the covalent bonds were destroyed, the phenolic impregnated carbon layer instantly spalled away. The spectrographic cannons continuously to rapidly detect and subsequently attack the successive layers of the ship. Seconds later, the titanium support structure disintegrated. Then, the silicon and oxygen atoms were ripped from the fiberglass insulation. The interior substructure, including the aluminum bulkheads, copper wires, steel nuts, bolts, etc., progressively disappeared as their metallic cohesion was lost. Eventually, the cannons reached the cargo holds. Wooden crates filled with solid potassium, coal, and sulfur were all vaporized in quick succession. Finally, the oxygen and hydrogen fuel tanks, the nitrogen purge tanks, a briquette of metallic sodium, and the steel engines were all atomized. In less than a minute, the ship was gone, and the 16 electrostatic cannons powered down. The draconians cheered and mocked the earthlings for once again for their continued impotence. But slowly, the original momentum of the plummeting ship continued to carry the cloud of dispersing atoms ever downward toward the draconian fortress. The atomic gases rolled into the city and through the streets. Finally, when the sodium atoms contacted the morning dew, they started an exothermic reaction that caused the oxygenated atmosphere to spontaneously react with the thousands of tons of carbon, potassium, and sulfur that had been once inside the cargo hold. In a tumultuous fireball that could be seen from space, the payload exploded with the force of a nuclear bomb. The churning mushroom cloud turned itself inside out as it swirled upward from the leveled city. This time, there were no draconians to mock the Earthmen.